What an afternoon. What an incredible series of events we've just had the opportunity to listen to and participate in. Really phenomenal. How Thank are y'all feeling? Do that again. One more time, because I think you can get louder. Okay. I knew you well, could do it. All right, some very quick real talk. I'm going to echo something that Mikhail said earlier. Community, this idea of community as a verb. Some of y'all probably heard me talk to you about this. Maybe we bumped into each other and had a little conversation about this idea I'm becoming increasingly obsessed about, which is that, what job do we do? What's your job? But, but if you were explaining to like your grandma, what would you say you do for a living? You don't talk to your grandma about what you do for a living? <laughs> What do you do? You translate concepts. Really? That's what you tell your grandma you do? What? You tell stories. That sounds like you might tell lies. I actually think you're in the communications business. Does that sound about right? Maybe in the communications for good business, because I think there's a distinction. Does that sound about right? So let yeah, me challenge okay. you with this idea, and I think Mikhail said it beautifully. Community is a verb, and I think the business that we are in is not actually communications, it's community building. Every one of you is responsible for building a community, and that means starting with these, listening, right? Because no one's going to pay attention to you unless they trust you, unless they're in community with you, unless you have a relationship with them. So maybe that's something we can talk about when we have drinks after this, and this is... Ladies and gentlemen, and everybody who's somewhere in between, I'd like to introduce to you Miss Latasha Brown from Black Voters Matter. Give it up, gang. Thank you. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Oh, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. How y'all doing? <laughs> You know, I wanted to start with that song. As you all know, many of you know um, who know me, I always start in song, and there's a reason for that. I always think it's really important that we talk about strategy, but what makes the difference is when we bring the human spirit in the room. And what music allows us to do is to bring spirit in the room and welcome, and so that we're connected and we feel this sense of connectivity. And as communications people, it's really important for us to feel this sense of being connected. And I specifically wanted to start with that song, This Little Light of Mine was a song that was my grandmother's favorite song. It was also a woman named Fannie Lou Hamer. Anybody ever heard of her? It was her favorite song as well. And I think it's really appropriate for each and every one of you in this space. You know, as I was thinking about what I wanted to talk about today, I really want you to think about where you sit in your organization and as a communications professional. Like wherever you are on the spectrum in terms of communications, I think we have to really recognize, to Sean's point, thank you, Sean, thank you for ComNet and all of you that have brought me here today, but I think it's really important to not miss this point that communications and community building is a dual interdependent strategy that we have to really recognize that even as communications professionals over the years, I think in many ways, some of our organizations, we've allowed that to erode. The, the pri priority of communications, oh, we're just gonna send out information. Do you all remember the days when you would just send a press release, you make a press release and put it on a fax machine and send it to a bunch of numbers? Do y'all know that, do y'all remember that? Yep. Those days are over. 
Do you remember that the only time that we would actually talk to each other was a dial phone or a phone that you would actually, I had gotten so good that I could actually hear the numbers and I would know what number it was. I would hear the, the, the tone and know what number it was, right? Those days are over. We're really in an era and in an age of communications. And so I think it's really important. The reason why I want to start with the song, This Little Light of Mine, is because for many of you, I want you to understand that in a moment that we're in, that we're literally in a politically, a very politically divided moment in our nation, that we're in a nation that we're seeing the rise up of white supremacy, that we're seeing the rise of those that actually are anti-democratic and are really working against democracy. If there was any time we needed some light, it is in this moment. And the beautiful thing about being a communications professional is that you really have a flick of light. You can actually shine light on information by giving information. You can shine light on inspiring people. My grandmother used to have this phrase that she would say, baby, you can speak life or death on somebody. Now, I didn't really know what that meant. Like, what, did, what do you mean by that? And she would often say that you actually have the power of life and death in your tongue, that you can actually say something, whether that's personal or professional, that can actually tear your organization down, that can actually tear down your grantees or your grantors, really, or you can actually help say something that can lift people up. And it doesn't also have to be, sometimes we think that it has to be something that is good and it feels good. It just has to be honest, authentic, and rooted in care and love and power. And so there's a story that I like to share. Who taught me more about communications? I always talk about who taught me to be an organizer. My first lesson and learning to be an organizer was actually learning to be a communicator. I, there was a woman, I was in Selma, Alabama at the time, and it was my first organizing job. I was in my 20s, and I had this job that we were going to go and um, organize residence councils for this housing authority, this public housing authority. And so everybody told me that we would have this meeting, this upcoming meeting, that I needed to get Miss Carolyn. That Miss Carolyn was this woman, she was a disabled, heavyset woman, um, maybe in her late 60s, early 70s, that didn't move around much, but everybody knew that Miss Carolyn knew everybody. And so I went to Miss Carolyn's house. I went to her home and I said, Miss Carolyn, I knocked at her door. I was so professional, y'all. I had all my notes. I had my, um, my flip chart and I, my flip chart and I went and I had my information to hand her. And I said, and I knocked at the door. I said, Miss Carolyn, you Miss Carolyn? She said, yeah, baby, come on in. So I went in and I sat down. I had all my stuff in my book bag. And I said, Miss Carolyn, I came by because I wanted, you know, we're doing this, this event on, on next Thursday or what, whatever the date was. Um, I gave her the date, and I really would like for you to come, to be a part of it, and if you can sign my petition, or you can sign um, this piece that you're actually supporting this work that we're doing around residence councils, and she said, baby, do you know what Victor did today? I said, I'm sorry. She said, Victor and Miss Chancellor. I said, wait, 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 wait. She was like, you don't know Victor and Miss Chancellor? I said, you mean like from the Young and Restless? And she said, yeah. She said, okay, that's right, you know. She said, oh, let me tell you what Victor did today, baby. And so she said, and so I'm sitting there shocked because I don't know what to do. So I'm sitting there shocked and I'm like, okay, well, how, okay. I, well, I haven't watched it in a while. So, um, so I figured if I let her talk, then I can get back to my business at hand, which was I wanted her to sign this information. So then I, she says, you know, I had some, I got some lemonade. You want some lemonade? I said, yes, ma'am. Every time I would try to bring up this piece that I wanted her to sign, she would, get, she would say something else. Oh, you had some lemonade? She would just talk over it. So I realized she was not going to let me talk about my mission of what I was there for, at least around signing this paper. So I did it a couple of days later. I said, I got to get Miss Carolyn, because everybody said I need Miss Carolyn. So I went again. I went again. The next time I went, I walked in. She said, come on in, baby. She said, come on in, baby. She said, no, let me tell you what Nikki did today. I said, okay. So I sat there and I listened to her around Nikki. I was like, okay. I tried to bring it back up again. She didn't let me bring it back up. So this went on about four times, four or five times. I don't even remember. By the fifth or sixth time, I had grown an affection to Miss Carolyn. So I wanted to see Miss Carolyn. So I went by Miss Carolyn's house. I went, she lived in this housing, um, housing community, this housing project community. And I go in her house and I had my book bag and my, my, and my flipboard and I set it down. And so I sat down ready for my chicken. And I was like, Miss Carolyn, what happened today? What did Nikki do today? And she said, 
aren't you supposed to be working? <laughs> I, said, I, I said, yes, ma'am, but I, she's like, where's that flip chart that you got? And I said, okay, okay, okay. so I get the flip chart, because I, I put it in the bag, y'all. So I get the flip chart, I pull the flip chart out. Those people paying you, and then you out here talking about the young and restless? <laughs> okay. I said, yes, ma'am. Well, don't you want me to sign the thing? I said, yes, ma'am. Well, give it here. So she takes it, and she signs it. We had the meeting that Thursday. The meeting was packed out. Matter of fact, it was standing room only. In that moment, let me tell you what she communicated to me. It was the moment that I communicated that she was more important to me then this sheet of paper that I wanted her to sign, that is the moment when I organized her. And I think we have to think about that in terms of our communications. That, that what Ms. Carolyn taught me in that moment is that it wasn't just about the task at hand. If I had just reduced her to this task of I needed you to sign this because I'm doing this thing and I'm getting paid for, then she was just simply another number. It was when I went and I was actually engaged in a real human-to-human -human conversation with her that I was actually what I call community building, that I was building community with her, that she saw the value in what I was doing, and as a result, we were able to actually communicate differently. And so I'm saying that because I think it's really important that we're in this space now that we have thought about, oftentimes, I think even in the industry, you know, how many of y'all heard that, you know, communication is just supposed to be kind of neutral, you're supposed to stay in this neutral space? The answer is no. <laughs> that is over with. And, and this is what I mean by that. Yes, you should be objective. But we're in an era that we're in an information era that people are literally, there's so much misinformation that's getting out there that are, people are really trying to shape what is the vision of the world. And I'm going to say this to you as communicators, right? I honestly believe this, and I'm not saying this just to say this. I actually believe that communications departments, and I hope some of the executives are in here to listen to this, I think that is your most important department in your entire organization. And I'll tell you why. Communications, the right communications, can either kill you or build you. And we have to really recognize what era we're in in this moment. In this moment, we're literally in a space that there's so much information that people have access to that they cannot, oftentimes they can't discern what is real, what is not real, what is true and what's not true. And when we're just saying that we're just going to put some, space, some basic information and just throw it out as if people just catch it and do what they want to, we're not really understanding the power of communications. There's never been a war ever existed on this planet that was not, did not start with words or with communications, ever. None of us ever fell in love. Well, maybe not a lot of words, but you know. <laughs> we might have communicated with our eyes or what have you, but there were some communications that happened. None of us have ever been hurt by someone that it wasn't communicated. Whether we interpret it right or wrong, communications is key because that's how human beings, that is how we engage each other. But oftentimes we're in a space and we're seeing it as in this very sterile space and not as a powerful, powerful community building mechanism. It is a mechanism for us to really be able to build community. In your organization, I can tell your organization by the tone of, tone of your, the language you use. I know whether you center people or center profit just by some of the verbs you use. I can tell what you believe as a, that's why so many organizations, so many corporations have put so much money into marketing. What is marketing? All that is is you're communicating a message. We're communicating a message. And so there are three big pieces that I want to kind of share as what I think are really core pieces we need to think about. The first one, which I said earlier, is around communications. You have to look at it as a community building strategy. It's not a strategy in isolation. You have to think about it. How are we communicating in such a way that we're building community? Whatever that community is, the community, your target community that you're looking at, 
However, how are you talking to them? And part of the way that you learn how to talk to people, guess what you got to do first? You've got to listen. You have to be able to listen to people. Before Cliff Albright and I created Black Voters Matter, for months, we literally went around in a cheap rental car, which I love to say, because I, I always hold that over his head. I was like, why we had to get the cheapest winter, a rental car that every time the wind would go, it would sway this way or that way. I was like, okay. But we went around for seven states, and all we did was listen. We were listening to see what people wanted, because if we were going to be effective at building an organization to organize people, we need to understand the people that we're working with. Sometimes we're so busy trying to communicate, like Miss Carolyn, communicate what it is that we want, that we forget to listen. She forced me to listen. She forced me to come and sit in her world. She forced me to actually be in alignment with the value that not only that it wasn't about me, but I actually could center her. And when she could see herself centered in that process, what happened? She showed up in a dramatic, amazing way that shifted my whole work. They thought I was the best organizer in the world after my, my few weeks because of Miss Carolyn. And I never left that strategy because ultimately all we're doing is we're connecting. We're connectors to human beings. We're connectors to humanity. And if humanity ever needed anything else, right, we, needed to we need to connect. And part of what their sci science shows that a baby, if a baby, an infant is not touched, right, if you're not communicating with that child, that that child will not survive. That is just how important communications is for us. And so I want you, wherever you're sitting in your organization, to realize how critical your role is, that your role as a communications professional is to really think about, one, how can I think about communications as a community building strategy? What is it that I do with language? If the language that I'm using, is it inclusive or is it exclusive? If you ever see a Black Voters Matter bus, which we say we're, we have the blackest bus in America that travels around the world, you will always see language that is we, it's about us, that is actually inclusive, so that it's not that our organization is separated from the people that we're actually working with. We're saying that we're of the people. We're a part of this process, and it's been extremely, extremely effective in terms of us organizing. The other piece that we want to do is as we are first starting, we started an organization, Black Voters Matter Fund. Who starts a fund with no money? <laughs> we did. <laughs> but what, what we knew is we knew that we actually had a vision that if we could actually communicate and really be simple, we were very simple about what we wanted to communicate as our vision. Our vision were three things. I call it the three M strategy. That one, we want to move money. We want to build movement by building out the ecosystem, and three, we wanted to shift the message. We wanted to have a message that was very different about what black, who black people were in the South. That I had gotten so frustrated with just seeing the news that everything I saw in the news is the, these black folk in the deep South are in these red states or you're, they don't have any power, you don't have the numbers. We wanted to shift that message. And I knew we had shifted the message, y'all, when I was looking at Fox News a couple of months after that, and they were talking about the new progressive black in the South. I was like, hmm, where did that come from? Right? That was intentional. We didn't wait until they gave us that title. We literally owned it. And so for our first year, there was over 18,000 hits about our organization that we were very intentional because we built the one of the first things we did is we built relationship with communications people. We built relationships with media. We actually invited the media to come on our first bus, our bus, first bus tour. We'd like, just come on, just like embed yourself in our work so you can see it yourself, so you can be included in it and that we can build relationship. So in the first bucket, when we're talking about community building, three things to note. One, relationships are your greatest capital. <laughs> build relationships with people in your, within your organization and the organizations that you're working with. The second thing is we all communicate how? Verbally and non-verbally. That is very important that we're mindful around what messages are we giving out verbally? What language are we using? Seriously, what verbs are you using? What nouns are you using? 
What words are you using? Are there words that you're using exclusive to your organization, right? Or are there words that are actually inclusive that people can see themselves in it? The third part of that, I think, when we're talking about kind of community building, it is important to be engaged authentically. Because sometimes we will have a message, have anybody came up with a slogan or a message in your organization, and you just loved it, and you went in the room with your colleagues, and they was like, we hate it, and you were devastated. But what's the point? The point is to communicate. And so if you're communicating a message and it doesn't resonate with them, it means it might be a really cute message, but the message doesn't work. And so it's really important that you always have a sounding board, why I said around the listening, so that you are actually engaged in what the message is. The second piece that I want to raise, which I talked about earlier, I mentioned earlier, communications will kill you or bill you. And I'm not saying that in a way that is, um, I'm not saying that in a way that I'm, I'm, I'm being curt. That honestly, they're part of the way that sometimes organizations, there have been foundations that in their language, people may or may not want to engage with them in organizations because they feel like this organization is not going to be mindful or respectful of their work. Something that's really simple about around even a phrase of what you should do. This is who you should do. This is what you should do. Like it's one thing to say what I think. And I know many of you all have been in this and are seasoned enough to know this. But it's really simple how something small can change just based on language. I can look at a television ad, particularly political ads. I would look at political ads and I could trace back if the political ads were made in the South or if they were made outside the South. It could be something as simple as the way that people say y'all. It could be very simple in the way people use context. And I'm raising that because the second point of this is culture will eat strategy for breakfast. So you can have a really good communication strategy if your communication strategy is not in alignment with the culture of wherever or whoever you're trying to talk to, it will not be effective. Matter of fact, it will be offensive. And then people may or may not tell you, but it's really important for us to really recognize how important culture is as a communication strategy that as we are building, are you building or are you killing? Are you speaking life or are you speaking death? The third thing that I want to say is no longer in this space as a communications, and I raised this earlier as well, can you see yourself as neutral? I am convinced that going forward, the most important, the most important space of building the kind of America that I see and desire, and I think I deserve, is going to be how we communicate with each other. It's going to be how we communicate and what do we communicate? Are we communicating that you have value or are we communicating the opposite? And so I think there are a couple of keys that I want to just raise around, around that I think is really important as we go forward. It is really important that sometimes we'll stay in the neutral waters, that I'm going to stay in language that I pull out. You, have you seen someone that create a sentence? I've done it myself. And you pull something out because you don't want to be offensive to anything, anybody, anywhere, right? But the sentence really doesn't say anything. The sentence might just say, trees, trees are trees. Because I'm not going to say a tree is green, because somebody might get offended if I say a tree is green. And I can't say the tree is pretty, because that might be a little bit, I'm, you know, that's not objective enough. The bottom line is, we are at war. Now, it may seem, that might seem really dramatic, and I know this is not a political space, but it is the truth. When we're actually in a space that I can't even communicate to my black children, my family's history, there is something fundamentally wrong with that. No matter who you are. And it's not okay. It is not okay. Because just as they come for me, they will come for you. And whoever that is, the bottom line is when we see something that is wrong, when we're quiet or we're silent around it, we are complicit 
where we're not speaking to it, where we're seeing racism, part of the reason that we're in the space we're in right now is because too many of us have been quiet. And in your being quiet, you have communicated that that's not important to you. Too many of us have allowed things to go on that have been hurtful and harmful. We sit here in the wealthiest nation in the world. We should be saying that we're in the healthiest nation in the world. Why are there millions of people living in poverty? And no matter where your job is or where you work, you should care. Why would you not want every single human being to have decent quality of life? If more of us believe that, this whole policy discussion wouldn't even be an issue, y'all. What we are living in is we're living in an era that we have shown that we lack imagination. I can give two or three examples, one quick example, of why I think it's really important around as we're talking about communications. I want everybody, I do this everywhere I go, I want everybody, wherever you're sitting, I want you to close your eyes. And I'm going to ask two questions. Only a couple of minutes left, so... My first question to you is, what would America look like without racism? The second question is, what would this nation look like if all human beings felt valued and respected? I didn't say you had to like them. I just said valued and respected. Open your eyes. Now, I can't really see, but I just want to ask, how many in the audience have ever been asked that question? I want you all to turn around and look. Maybe four people. There is nothing that has ever manifested in the physical world that wasn't first envisioned. I am raising this. Because who we are as communicators, we are creatives. And it's important for us to really start thinking deeply about the world that we are creating. Your words are creating the world that your children will inherit. What you are putting out is setting the tone of what the values are of this nation. And just like race is an artificial construct that was created and racism was used as a tool to weaponize and actually move against the humanity of people, if someone can create that, we can actually deconstruct that. But in order to deconstruct it, you've got to use your radical reimagination of every single system. The fact that we're not as a nation, that we're not even thinking about the possibility of this nation could be without racism, we will never get there. That means that we'll constantly be responding to something that says some human beings have less value than others. And it doesn't stop there. It starts it start in every single area. We've seen it. We've seen it in gender. We've seen it in sexuality. We've seen it in people's faith choices. The bottom line is, we are creative enough to put a man on the moon. We're creative enough that as we speak right now, there's a satellite that is out in the universe, out in space somewhere, that's making sure that our telephones ping to tell you don't forget to bring that chicken home when you come back. <laughs> we are creative enough to live in the wealthiest nation in the world. We're creative enough to use the resources in this nation and demand that basic humanity is valued. And if we're not doing that, then what are we doing? What is the point? What is the point? Even if everybody had, and I know people have positions around, political positions around health care and who should have health care and who shouldn't have health care, just something that simple, something that simple as health care. What's the worst case scenario? Everybody get health care and then people get well. <laughs> I mean, I just didn't want those poor people to get well. I mean, goodness. I 
I should be the only person getting well. And as foolish as that sounds, that's a value that we have held up in this nation, which is why we don't have health care. Because we believe that there are some people that are more deserving than others. We throw away food. Many of us are thinking about right now all the hundreds of options of food. Yet there are people right now that don't know where they're going to get their next morsel from. And that sounds like we, we don't believe it. I've seen it. I've worked in it. The good news, the good news is that you can do something about it. That the power in this room alone, and I am serious about this, that the power in this room alone can actually shift the trajectory of this nation. Absolutely. That you have been given an enormous gift. You have been given a gift that you can actually message. You have been given a gift and a position that you can literally shape the context of values. That's how things get changed. You're putting something, information and ideas out there and people start gravitating to them and they start believing them. I didn't really realize that until I was on MSNBC. I started being a commentator on MSNBC and I would talk to folks and as I would talk to people, many of the people would actually say some of the same things I was saying back to me, right? And I was like, no, 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 no. I don't want to know what I'm thinking. I want to know what you're thinking. But what it made me think about is how important and how powerful and how I literally have to be accountable of what I'm saying. Because what I am saying does have influence. It has power. What you are communicating through your organizations has power. And those of you that are in organizations, some of you all maybe have shops in organizations that your communications were kind of like the, the, it was like the side thing, right? That we just want you, when we do get some good work, just tell people of the good work we did, right? You are misusing and underutilizing an powerful, important tool for your organization that you can actually advance your work and your organization's mission Literally, if you invest and reposition communications, that we have to invest and make sure that we're investing in talent within our organization, that we're paying them well, that we're getting them training, that we're connecting them, that we're actually engaged in conversations. That's really important. No longer are the days that anybody can sit, make a blank a press release, and then just shoot a fax. That's over. And so how we communicate with these platforms, and it is irresponsible, given now that we're in such an era that literally what we see over and over again is so much information that people cannot discern or distinguish. So I'll just share with how we've been able to distinguish through Black Voters Matter. Part of what we've been able to do and what has literally been, I think, our cornerstones, I call it the, the four Vs. It has been one vision, we had a vision of those things that we wanted to do. We wanted to create a fund. Yet in five years, we went from no money to actually we wanted to create an organization that would actually invest money on the ground. We've actually put $32 million on the ground in grassroots black-led groups. <laughs> just on vision. But we would not have been able to get $32 million if we could not articulate and communicate that vision, not just with our funders, but communicate more importantly, that envision to the Miss Carolyn's of the world. And part of the reason why we were able to be able to, to communicate that vision to the Miss Carolyn's of the world is because Miss Carolyn gave us the vision that we went out and we listened to people and they told us what we want, they wanted, right? My grandmother would always say that if you want someone to not complain about the food, invite them in the kitchen to cook with you. And so we have to really think about how we're engaging. How are you all engaging your messages? Are you just doing it in your office? Are you just testing your messages in your office? Or are you literally taking the opportunity to re be able to test it outside of that? I think the other piece too, that when we thought about um, our vision and our voice, what was our voice? We wanted to have a voice that was a collective voice. That while we would do individual pieces, that our organization would represent a collective that wouldn't be, this is how bad we are, but it would say, this is who we are. 
that black voters matter, you will never see a phrase that we're talking to people like it's us versus them. It is always an inclusive language intentionally. And then we wanted to do two cornerstones. We wanted people to know what it is that, what were our bookends? Now, what is it that we believe? There were two things that we said we were going to be just non-negotiable around. And that would, we would always talk about love and power. That ultimately, that love and power was a thing that we thought could actually, we had the audacity to believe that love and power could transform the world. And we, be, we still believe it. And we spread love and build power. That's what we put all of our work in. And it actually helps ground us in what we're doing and what we believe. And so fundamentally, as you're thinking, we come up with these, all these nice little bullet points. Y'all know how we come up with these nice mission statements and bullet points, right, that sound good technically, but they're not saying anything because they're not rooted in truth and authenticity and something that's going to make people feel connected and feel a sense of connectivity. And so there's a unique opportunity that COVID has brought us. COVID has brought us a unique opportunity to actually step back and see that people were lonely Folks miss human interaction. You know, if you look at some of the, the TikToks that I look at on, 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 um, about the folks on the airplane, I'm like, then sometimes folks forgot. I was like, people forgot how to fly, didn't they? <laughs> but the good news is that we're communications people, that we can literally take this moment and reframe the narrative and shift a narrative that gives people hope, that gives people a North Star, something to believe in. I think part of what we get caught up in oftentimes is what currently exists and how will we respond to what exists instead of what could be. In my astronomy class, I remember the professor said that most of the stars that we see in, in the sky right now no longer exist. Many of them actually burned out millions of years ago. They're phantom stars. The bottom line is, I don't know about y'all, right? But it doesn't matter who is trying to take somebody back. I don't even know why, where they're trying to take folks back, right? That's over with. We are centered in a space in this nation that is younger, that is more diverse, and we aren't going anywhere. That women aren't going anywhere. It is a gift to us. It is not a burden, it is a blessing that we have the level of diversity of thought, that we have the level, even myself, I think of myself, I don't even agree with myself in a, uh, in a full week. <laughs> it is not natural for us to think that we can only create a world that is just for someone that agrees or thinks the same way I think. What we have to do is if we created a world that we all at the basic valued each other's humanity. We could work through the other stuff. We could maneuver the other things, but we've forgotten how to communicate. But the good news is this last V is around victory. That listen, my favorite song is all I do is win, 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 <laughs> right? No matter what, like y'all are staying in Georgia. I am like literally, I am, for some reason, I am addicted to impossible feats. And part of it because I know the possibilities of the human spirit. I know what we can do. I know what has been done. I know that the fact that I am standing here in the state of Georgia, right, where I, it was illegal for me to even walk, my ancestors to even walk on this ground. I couldn't even come in a hotel and my people couldn't come in a hotel outside of actually being part of the help. But here I am on the stage, not because of something I did. There were people like you. There were people who created the foundation and they communicated. They communicated a dream and a speech about a dream. And they communicated something that other people, when they couldn't even see any way out, they could see some way out. That is what you have the opportunity to do. So if you don't re remember anything that I say, recognize that you, in fact, are the new MVP. That we need you. We need your authenticity. We need your truth. We need your courage. We need your love. And so what if every single thing that you wrote on paper, you literally checked it with, where is the love in this? 
Now, where's the power? What would your writing look like? What would you communicate for your organization? What would you communicate to each other? And so with that, I just want to say thank you. And I want you to hear me, each and every one of you, in the space. This has been a really challenging time for us. It's been so much going on. We're in this unique time. I, you know, as I talk to people, they're like, oh, woe is me. It's so terrible. That's not what I believe. I actually believe we're in the most wonderful opportunity, time of opportunity, because now we can actually tell the truth. We can deal with the truth. We actually have to uproot the racism that we've said that we've ignored. Do you know how, in, how insulting it is to say you colorblind? That I don't see color? Don't say that anymore. Just stop it. Because not only do I see color, but I love color. It's beautiful. It's a blessing. It's a gifting. But in you saying that, what you are saying is, I don't want to see color. Because we're communicating what we say and we're communicating what we don't say. And so given that, I'm going to ask us just to do a couple of things as we get ready to leave and as you move forward. I know today has been an amazing day. But as you go forward, take the word love. Love. I need communications people. Say love. Love. L, leadership. Leadership. I need you as a communications professional. I need you to run that thing. Wherever you are in your department, run it. (laughs) Step up. You need to operate like you are the MVP of that space because we need you. We need your clarity. We need your voice. We need your contribution. Oh. Oh. Say oh. Oh. Opportunity. Opportunity. If you don't see opportunity in this moment, you're not looking hard enough. You are surrounded by opportunities. Instead of seeing the challenges and all the negative things that are happening, whatever you look at and focus on the most, that's all you'll see. You have to always be able to see the opportunity. So as you are communicating in your organization, always really drill down to figure out what is the opportunity in this message to build love and power. Opportunity V. V. Say victory. 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 Listen, let me tell you one thing, and I know I'm a little over time, but I want to say this real quick. That victory, I remember looking at the Olympics, the Winter Olympics a couple of years back. And what was the interesting thing is when I saw the bronze winner, the bronze and the gold winners, they were like, oh, I'm so glad that I made it. It was just hard, but I'm glad that I made it. Every, I mean, the bronze and the silver, every single gold medalist that I heard at the Winter Olympics, I swear y'all, said, you know, I knew I had to beat my time, so I beat my time. None of them were shocked that they won the the, the goal because they knew they were winners before they started running. Their goal was, how can I push myself? I'm saying that because oftentimes we're approaching this space as if we're not winners. I wake up expecting to win the day, every single day. I walk in rooms with funders, bringing them an opportunity to fund me. I'm not begging. I do some good work. And so I provide an opportunity for you. And what if we're really shifting our paradigm to see that? E. E. This ain't sexy, but it is necessary. Educate. Educate. I need y'all to say that like you mean it. Educate. You have to always, as a communications person, you need to see first and foremost that your job is to educate. To educate yourself, educate those around you, and educate whoever you are communicating that with. And as I end this, I'll just say, Well, the first thing I did right was the day I started to fight. Keep your eyes on the prize and hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Keep your eyes on the prize.
hands and hold on, hold on. Remember, we can do this all with love and what? Y'all got to say y'all communications people. Come on now. With love and peace and blessings. Love you. Thank you. Thank you. That's right.